So today I'm going to talk about uh, AI and ethics, so, uh, try to come up with sort of a robust normative framework. Uh, this comes uh, a bit from the introduction that you may or may not have read, uh, but I'll add some new material uh, to that as well. Okay, so AI, as we know, is becoming uh, more and more capable. Here's Lee Se Do, the 18 time world champion uh, of the easy to learn but very difficult to master game of Go. And you know, in 2016, Google created AlphaGo, which learned to play Go by playing against itself, and it was able to beat uh, Lee Se Do four games out of five. And you know, something that experts didn't think would happen anytime soon. Uh, in healthcare, AI has begun to identify some types of cancer better than doctors, uh, diagnose various eye diseases as well as ophthalmologists, and identify uh, viable embryos as well as fertility specialists do. And recently, uh, an AI-generated artwork won the first place in an art contest. This was in uh, Colorado by Jason Allen. Um, it's the theater, the opera, spatial. Uh, spatial. Um, and it raises questions about what counts as art. Uh, and here's Blake Lemoyne, a software engineer uh, who claimed uh, last year that Lambda, a, a Google chatbot, is sentient. Uh, that is, it has feelings and is self-aware. And of course, we all know about the recent development uh, with ChatGPT and its ability to write codes, music, poems, and even college essays. So as AI technologies continue to advance, uh, questions about the ethics of AI become more and more pressing. Uh, so Cindy mentioned that I like the trolley problems. I, I, I still do. So in an emergency, should a self-driving car prioritize the lives of the passengers or the lives of pedestrians? Should we as a society allow or ban lethal autonomous weapons that can find and destroy targets without human intervention? What type of governance structure do we need to regulate uh, such technologies? How can we create an AI uh, system that is fair and that doesn't inadvertently discriminate like this one against uh, people of uh, sort of, uh, of color? So what I want to do today is to come up with an ethical framework that can help us navigate these uh, thorny issues. And as we're going to see, it's going to be helpful to distinguish between um, ethical issues that arise because current AI systems are limited in certain ways, what I call vulnerability in machine learning, and ethical issues that arise because current AI systems may be working too well and humans are vulnerable when interacting with these systems, what I call human vulnerabilities. So um, you know, I'm speaking to a room full of uh, AI experts, so I don't have to say a lot about what AI is. Yeah, uh, there's no agreed upon definition, so I'll be very quick. Um, there's no agreed upon definition of AI. Uh, we can take it to be something like getting machines to do things that require thinking, learning, and problem solving. Um, and as everybody here knows, you know, one form, uh, AI can take many forms. One is symbolic AI, which is uses a series of if-then rules and statements to establish the relations between inputs and outputs. And another form is, of course, machine learning, which uses algorithms to learn from data without uh, being explicitly programmed to do so. And you know, everybody here knows about supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So I'm not going to go over that. Um, and I'm not going to go over the reinforcement learning. Um, uh, these methods can be combined with deep learning, which uses different layers of nodes to detect increasingly abstract features. And deep learning is the main driver for many of the breakthroughs in today's technologies. So. As impressive as machine learning is, it also suffers certain limitations, which can give rise to a host of ethical issues. So first, machine learning needs a lot of data to work well. And what this means is that, as a result, companies have a very strong incentive to harvest or buy data, including sensitive personal data, even when doing so could violate an individual's right to privacy. 
So an example of this is when the NHS, so this is in the UK, uh, gave the personal data of about 1.6 million patients to Google to test a novel way of detecting kidney injuries. But the problem was they didn't properly tell the patients about how their health data will be used. Secondly, um, machine learning is only as good as the data from which it learns. So if a machine learning algorithm is trained on inadequate or inaccurate data, then the algorithms will make bad predictions. So this is known as the garbage in, garbage out problem. So for instance, algorithms uh, trained on gender imbalanced medical imaging data sets have been found to do worse at reading the chest x-rays for underrepresented gender. Now, third, if the algorithm itself is bad, it's also gonna make bad predictions. So for instance, an algorithm may identify a pattern even when there isn't one, a problem known as overfitting, or it may fail to identify a pattern even when there is one, a problem known as underfitting. And faulty algorithms can have serious ethical implications. So for example, an algorithm used widely in US hospitals to determine which patients should get extra care. And it was bound to discriminate against uh, uh, people of color because it used health costs as a proxy for health needs. And because of structural inequalities, uh, uh, people of color often spend much less on healthcare than white patients. So as a result, the algorithm falsely concluded that they were healthier than equally sick uh, white patients. Fourth, um, deep learning typically employs thousands or even millions of connections that interact with one another in very complex ways. So as a result, it's very difficult to know what's going on, what these interactions mean. And this black box nature of deep learning raises questions of explainability and trust. So for example, a deep learning algorithm may tell you that someone is likely to commit another crime, but it's not gonna be able to explain why. And because it's a black box, we don't know whether what it's saying, uh, it's saying what it's saying on reasonable and reliable grounds. And so given this, it's also difficult to trust such a system. And for high stake decisions, such as whether to keep someone in jail, not being able to trust a deep learning system is uh, especially worrisome. So, you know, I, I will, because, you know, I, um, speaking to a room full of experts, I thought, you know, I would mention this particular point as well, um, which is whether there are technical ways to address or mitigate deep learning's black box problem. So some AI researchers are currently exploring uh, technical fixes such as interpretable machine learning. And one such method involves adding a deep learning model to a, uh, 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 adding an additional layer, uh, uh, sort of a, an additional layer after the hidden layer of nodes and before the output. And the idea here is that the added layer will provide information such as, you know, which features were the most important for arriving at a particular prediction. And the hope is that this information would then make the deep learning system more interpretable. Now, I think there are a number of problems with this uh, approach. One is that because it's placed outside of the black box, the additional layer provides a kind of post hoc explanation of the black box after it has already made its predictions. So you might wonder whether this post hoc explanation would give us the actual reasons why a black box gave the predictions that it did. So think of this as a kind of dilemma. So either the predictions are based on these po post hoc explanations, or they're not. Okay, so if they're not, if these predictions are not based on these post hoc explanations, then what's the value of these explanations? They might just be a kind of post hoc rationalization um, that doesn't correspond to how the black box has arrived at its prediction. Now suppose that the prediction are based on these explanations, well then presumably, it's possible to design a new model using just these using just these post hoc explanations. Um, and what this means is that then you can get rid of the black box. And maybe, in fact, this suggests a way to test the value of these interpretable machine learning systems. Uh, if the black box remains indispensable for making predictions, 
This suggests that these uh, interpretable machine learning systems, these explanations that are given post hoc, have not given us all the relevant explanations of why a black box gave the predictions that it did. Okay, so other people have said that, well, maybe what we should care about is, um, is uh, you know, we should care more about accuracy rather than interpretability. So take an example from healthcare. Some people say that clinicians prescribe medications all the time without fully understanding why these medications work. So for example, you know, you might say aspirin has been prescribed for nearly a century, but we don't really know how it, uh, it really works, right? But while we may not fully understand how medications work in many cases, arguably what we do have some ideas regarding the causal mechanisms through which they work. So just take the aspirin example, people knew that something from a willow causes fever and pain to be reduced, even if they did not know about salicylic uh, 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 acid, an active ingredient in the production of aspirin. And this contrasts with the machine learning system, which works through associations and is at least for now, unable to track causal relationships. And to see why this matters, um, uh, it's helpful to point out that machine learning is vulnerable to uh, a number of adversarial attacks. So we know that deep neural networks are vulnerable to generative uh, adversarial attacks. So here's a one pixel attack. Um, and researchers have found that, for example, by ch just changing one pixel in an image, they can get an algorithm to classify an image of a ship as a car uh, with 99.7% confidence. Now, for our purpose, if a deep learning network can be tricked in this way, then we're still going to be concerned with explainability and trust, especially in high stake domains uh, where humans uh, could be harmed, right? So in another study, researchers made point, a 0.04% change to the pixel values in an input image. So only about 400 pixels out of a million. Now, these changes were imperceptible to the human eye, as you can see. But nevertheless, the deep neural network classified a panda as a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. And recently, researchers have shown that adversarial attacks can actually be done on medical machine learning. Uh, so here, here's an example. And the fact, so uh, again, uh, so given all the ways that machine learning could fail, you know, it's critical that companies and AI researchers have an appropriate ethical framework that they can follow when developing these technologies. Okay, so let me now consider ethical issues that, that can arise because current machine learning systems may be working too well and humans are vulnerable in various ways in their presence. So let's begin with some examples. So, as we know, facial recognition technologies are getting better and better. On the plus side, they can help us find criminals more quick, quickly and identify children who are missing or kidnapped. But on the negative side, a government could use this technology to monitor its citizens or to profile and discriminate against members of a minority group. So take, for example, here's a controversial study from Stanford, which allegedly found that a machine learning system could correctly distinguish between gay and straight sexual orientation 81% of the time for men and 74% of the time for women just by examining photos of their faces. Now, you can imagine that a government can uh, uh, that criminalizes homosexuality could use this facial recognition technology to identify and discriminate against homosexuals. Um, and so for our purpose, this is an example where machine learning may be working too well and ethical issues arise because people may be tempted to use it, uh, use it for bad reasons. Okay, so uh, secondly, deep fake videos are coming. Here's one of Tom Cruise. Uh, let me just see if I can play it. Um, let's see. Okay, TikTok, impression time. This is a five second impression of a snapping turtle coming out of its shell.
<laughs> Did I mess up my hair? Nope. Okay, so that's not Tom Cruise. That's the guy on the left, right? And these videos are getting better and better. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a um, uh, a video, uh, sort of an audio of sort of, uh, you know, someone just took Nancy Pelosi's words and just slowed it down. And it kind of went viral because people thought that, you know, they were sort of saying that she had, um, you know, she had dementia and all these other different things. You know, she was slurring her words. Um, and it turned out that it was, you know, it was a very low tech way of doctoring the audio. And that already went viral. So think of what the, you know, deep fake, uh, fake videos can do in the future, uh, especially in our sort of increasingly polarized uh, society. Okay, TikTok. Sorry. There we go. So here's a third example. Uh, so a study from McKinsey predicted that by 2030, about 30% 30 of human labor uh, could be replaced by automation. So how do we help people? Again, this is sort of uh, machine learning doing, you know, doing too good of a job. How do we help people who will lose their jobs to robots? Or take like the AI art example that I gave earlier. What if you know, art now starts to get generated by computers? So when we when talking about AI ethics today, uh, many people immediately think of fairness and bias, and these are definitely very important issues. But these issues tend to come up because current AI systems are limited in certain ways. Um, sort of the first set of issues that I talked about. It's not so much because I think uh, at least uh, for the most part, researchers themselves are not biased, but the data are, and so. Uh, then you get into those type of issues because of the limitations with respect to inaccurate uh, or inadequate data. Now, it's important to recognize, I think, that there are other ethical issues besides uh, fairness and bias. So take deep fake technologies, for example. The concern that they could undermine democracy is more than just about fairness and bias. And in recent years, uh, there have been a great number of ethical frameworks that uh, for AI that have been proposed. So today, there are over 80 such frameworks from private companies, governmental agencies, academic research institutions, and intergovernmental and other organizations. And these frameworks have something, some recommendations in common. So many of them actually draw on the four principles of biomedical ethics, so autonomy or respect, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And so, among other things, autonomy seeks to ensure that, you know, patients and consumers are fully informed of and understand the, uh, the risks and benefits of a particular AI technology and voluntarily consent to it. Beneficence aims to guarantee that AI participants promote the well-being of the patients and that of society as a whole. Non-maleficence strives to ensure that AI technologies do not impose undue harm on patients. And justice seeks to promote the fair and equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens of AI. Now, in addition to these four principles, many frameworks also list such recommendations as transparency, explainability, and trust, given that some forms of AI are not easily understood, even by those who program them. Now, at the same time, many organizations offer, also offer their own distinct recommendations. So here's one from the Future of Life Institute. It lists value alignment uh, as, a, as a ethical recommendation. And that says that highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with the human values. Or Microsoft recommends inclusiveness, according to which AI systems should empower everyone and engage people. Now, in one sense, it's, it, I think it's great that these organizations uh, cared enough about ethics to put forward these frameworks. But in another sense, this proliferation of ethical frameworks has created some confusion uh, 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 from which pressing questions arise. So for example, how were these particular sets of recommendations developed and not others? Which recommendations should AI uh, uh, developers and organizations follow and why? And more fundamentally, what grounds and justifies these recommendations? How do we distinguish between recommendations that are genuine ethical principles from those that aren't? 
how do we, how does one use these recommendations in practice? Uh, for instance, it seems reasonable that we shouldn't impose and do harm on subjects, but how do we actually go about achieving that? Or it seems reasonable that we should be able to trust an AI system, but how do we decide which AI system uh, to trust? Now, unfortunately, most of these frameworks have been very silent on the, these questions. And as a result, they've been criticized for offering abstract high-level principles that in practice have provided few concrete guidance. And moreover, some have uh, thought that you know, these frameworks are just a kind of ethics washing uh, and virtue signaling, where organizations and companies are just exaggerating their interest in ethical AI as a public relations exercise and maybe to forestall governmental re regulation. So I think to staff off uh, these such accusations, we need an AI ethics framework that is grounded in substantive normative theory and one that can help us assess whether a uh, recommendation is genuine or not, and one that can give us more concrete guidance. OK, so I'm going to try to sketch that uh, in uh, sort of for the remaining part of the talk. So elsewhere, I've argued that human beings have human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So as I see it, a good life, this is, uh, it's meant to be intuitive. A good life is just one spent in pursuing activities such as deep personal relationships with one's partner, uh, friends, parents, children, knowledge of the workings of the world, of oneself, of others, active pleasures such as creative work and play, and passive pleasures such as appreciating beauty. And uh, what I'm calling the fundamental conditions these are just the various goods, capacities, and options that human beings, qua human beings, need, uh, whatever else they might need in order to pursue those things that I just talked about. So for example, the fundamental goods are uh, things like food, water, and air. The fundamental capacities are uh, things like uh, the capacity to think, to be motivated by facts, to know, uh, to choose and act freely, to appreciate the worth of something, uh, to develop interpersonal relationships and to have control of the direction of one's life, uh, 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 i.e. autonomy. And the fundamental options are those social forms and institutions that human beings require if they're able to um, exercise uh, their essential capacities to engage in these basic activities. Um, and I've argued elsewhere that you know these fundamental conditions are uh, ground human rights because they're really important to us, uh, and rights can offer uh, offer powerful protection to those who possess them. And the former is true because if anything is of fundamental importance uh, to us, then it's going to be being able to pursue a characteristically uh, good human life. And it seems clear that if we care about some end, then we should care about uh, sort of the essential means to. Uh, these ends, okay? And rights, we all know that they're very powerful by their nature, rights secure the interests of the rights holders uh, by requiring other people to do certain things for them or not to interfere with them. Um, and they, they also prevent us, uh, you know, sort of in normative theory, rights are, they stand in contrast to utilitarian theory, so they prevent us from being uh, sort of part of a first order utilitarian calculus which is a good thing. So we can't be used as mere means, as Kant would say. So given the strong protections that rights can offer for the rights holder, so given the importance of having these fundamental conditions to human beings, it seems reasonable that human beings should have these rights. And so this gives us some explanation for why human beings have human rights to these fundamental conditions. So I think the fundamental conditions approach can explain why many of the recommendations uh, are found in uh, various AI frameworks of genuine ethical principles. And I won't go through it exhaustively. I'm just gonna give uh, uh, an example. So take autonomy, right? Which is found in many examples uh, uh, in many frameworks, which requires that subjects be fully informed and understand the risks and benefits of uh, AI application and that they voluntarily consent to it. Well, the fundamental conditions approach can readily explain why, right? As Noted earlier, autonomy understood that being able to uh, being able to control the direction of one's life is one of the fundamental conditions. 
And to be able to control the direction of one's life in the context of AI and applications, one needs to be informed of and understand the risks and benefits of how that technology is going to work. And once and the use needs to be voluntary. So the fundamental conditions approach can, you know, implies that when we develop AI technologies, we uh, inform consent is going to be very important. And, you know, and people should be able to make that decision without being coerced or exploited. Now, fundamental conditions approach, I just want to also say this, which is that it'll also exclude uh, some recommendations as genuine ethical principles. And to just give one example, take value alignment found in the future of life, uh, which says, you know, highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with human values. Now, many people endorse this because they're concerned that AI systems are going to, uh, you know, outpace humans, and they want to ensure that algorithms are designed in such a way that will not, that they will not harm humanity. Now, while this is a laudable goal, it's not clear that AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors align with human values, given that human values vary widely and only some of them are good, right? So while many people would recar uh, regard Mother Teresa as a moral exemplar, there are others who are not and who would instead regard autocratic dictators and racists as more moral exemplars. Um, but at least in my view, AI systems should not be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with the values of those who prefer autocrats and racists. So a more plausible principle in the vicinity is that AI systems should be designed so that their goals respect uh, and behaviors respect persons or humanity as ends in themselves. And if that's the claim, then the fundamental condition approach can explain why this would be a genuine principle, given that having our moral status as person respected is a fundamental condition for pursuing uh, the activities that we want to pursue. Indeed, if our moral status as persons were not respected, then others would be at liberty to use us as mere means to their own end. And if so, we wouldn't have the kind of control necessary to determine the direction of our uh, lives. And so I hope this shows that the fundamental conditions approach gives us a critical edge to tell, you know, we can use it to see which ones are genuine ethical principles and which ones are not. Okay, I think there are other reasons why we should adopt the human rights uh, approach. I'll just briefly mention some of them. So first, I think respecting and promoting human rights is compulsory. It's not something that you can choose not to do. And secondly, I think human rights are rights against everybody. And what this means uh, is that governments, corporations, individual AI researchers all have the responsibility to make sure that AI technologies do not violate human rights. So to illustrate a practical upshot of this, suppose that a user has signed an informed consent form or an end user license agreement. So giving us permission to use the user's personal data. Does this mean that we can now do whatever we want with the user's data as long as it's within the terms of the agreement? I don't think so. I think the human rights perspective says that we still have the responsibility uh, to make sure that we do not use the user's data in ways that could undermine their human rights. So we have to be good stewards of their uh, data because of their, the rights that they have. Third, I think the human rights framework helps us to see which values are in conflict. So take massive surveillance using facial recognition technologies, and we can here we can see that the conflict is between law and order and our human rights to privacy. And the question for us is whether law and order should always trump the right to privacy. And there are reasons to doubt this. So say that in the future, you can implant uh, biometric devices that can track an, in, an individual's movements and possibly even her thoughts. If law and order always trumps uh, 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 the right to privacy, it seems that it would be permissible to require citizens to have such implants. But this seems like an overreach. And so there are circumstances when law and order uh, don't trump the right to privacy. Okay, so now I just want to uh, uh, comment on what the human rights framework tell us what we should do in practice when governing AI. 
So a lot of people now, uh, at least in this space, uh, at least bioethicists have been thinking about IRBs, right? Um, and the idea here is that so institutional review boards, they, uh, they're, you know, typically you have them, you know, when, when you're doing human subject research and certainly in the biomedical context, right? And they've worked really well in the pharmaceutical context. And one thought is maybe we need something like this to regulate AI, especially when the AI is being used in, say, healthcare context. And we can talk more about that in Q&A. Now, also, we've seen that a pressing problem with uh, current uh, iteration of deep learning systems is that their learning is, in some sense, superficial. That is, they don't really learn about real features of the world, such as causal relations. Even ChatGPT, generative AI, doesn't do that either. Right. And as such, deep learning is prone to getting things seriously wrong, as its vulnerability to adversarial attacks suggests. So to reduce the risk of algorithms going astray, uh, there are at least two options. The first option is to hold the algorithms fixed so that they would give the same results whenever they are provided with the same inputs, or as the FDA puts it, to use locked algorithms. Now, by contrast, adaptive algorithms are, uh, you know, are ones where they learn continuously, which means that for a given set of inputs, the outputs may change as the learning process is updated. Now, a second option would be to hold the environment <coughs> in which the algorithms operate fixed and allow for the use of adaptive algorithms. So take, for example, next generation robotic surgeons Say we would like to use adaptive algorithms in such robotic, re, robotic surgeons. So we may be able to reduce the risk of algorithms going astray by holding the environment in which they operate fixed. So maybe we can do this by allowing uh, a robotic surgeon only to perform tasks that it can do with a high degree of accuracy, such as incisions or suturing. But in many healthcare applications, however, it may be very difficult to hold the environment in which algorithms operate fixed. Since many such applications involve the human organism, the light processes of which are in constant flux and therefore difficult to hold fixed. So th given this, it, may, it seems that the first option, locking the algorithm itself, may be preferable uh, for many types of at least, you know, sort of algorithms that are being used on humans, at least in the near future. But does that mean that we can't, you know, but it seems like if we use locked algorithms, we might lose the advantage of adaptive algorithms, right? The whole machine learning, that's the whole point. Um, but I think maybe we can still take advantage of adaptive algorithms through what might be called staggered learning. So staggered learning involves allowing adaptive algorithms to learn and generate new input-output relations, but not to apply that new learning synchronously. Okay, so the idea here is that once the new connections between inputs and outputs have been verified and validated, they could then be used to develop a new and updated locked algorithm, right? So maybe you can use locked algorithm and simultaneously collect new data for new updates, but you don't use those data right away and then use, use that for the next version. So in this way, learning could still occur, but it would be done in steps uh, rather than uh, synchronously. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, novel AI technologies can be really exciting, but they also raise a number of ethical issues. Whenever we're developing new technologies, we should not just ask whether we can do something, but also whether we should do them. I propose that the human rights framework can serve as a baseline from, from which we can make these important decisions that can affect uh, all of our lives. Thank you.